So um, I want to start, like Ophelia, I want to start with an example. In this case, it's going to be a minimal pair. So the question that I want to ask about today is how artworks in different media deploy imagination in different ways uh, to express perspectives. And I am partial, I'm interested in the thought that there are and want to sort of push us to think more about the ways in which there are importantly different kinds of imagination and uses of imagination. Um, but I'm not going to press the idea that there are different kinds of imagination here. Rather, I want to sort of be thinking about different ways in which imagination works in different media and for different kinds of purposes. So I want to start by giving us a kind of contrast between two presentations of the classic, uh, you know, the story of the sacrifice, sacrifice of Isaac. So I'll just pause here. This is from Genesis. I'm just going to I'm going to read it through and give you time to do that yourselves. Painful silence. Okay, and now I declare that I'm going to move on. So here is a depiction by Caravaggio from 1602. I apologize for pixelation when I just go in here uh, of the same the same situation, the same scene. So I take it that these two presentations are, in some sense, are informationally they're not equivalent, but they're informationally very close. Uh, highly overlapping, um, but there are, you know, deep differences between the two. One is that they're in different media. Another is that they differ perspectively. They sort of focus different uh, in on different aspects of the situation of this of the scenario of the story, and they invite different kinds of responses. And I'll go back to this later. But I guess I would say one thing is that you know just leaps out for me is that um, in this. Genesis story, there's a, the focus is on Abraham, um, Abraham's relation to God and, uh, um, and his being caught between his relationship to God and um, to his son. Um, here, we, and we hear very, very little about Isaac, um, uh, whereas here, the angel and certainly, especially Isaac, uh, have a more uh, a more of a presence in certain ways. But again, uh, you know, but though also Abraham is, you know, literally at the center of the of the story. So I'm gonna want to think about that and how are these different? So how are these different artworks, despite displaying the same, talking about just representing this, what is in some sense the same scene? They invite different kinds of imagination and different response correlative responses. How can we think about how that happens? Okay, so in order to think about how um, imagination uh, can work differently in these different artworks and different media, in order to express different kinds of perspectives and invite different kinds of interpretive responses, we first need some kind of account of what a perspective is in the relevant kind of sense, this interpretive perspective that invites a kind of response. And that of course is a huge uh, you know, topic in its own right, um, a matter for another day. Um, the, I wanna just give a sort of quick tour through that, uh, how I think about that now. Um, the first thing I want to do is step back and think, point out that this isn't a merely aesthetic phenomenon. This is a, the notion of perspective that's operative here is something that we appeal to, you know, ubiquitously in ordinary discourse and in theoretical analysis, um, though often in a very amorphous way, across a wide range of domains. Um, and uh, it, we see it most palpably, it is both most frustrating and most sort of interesting uh, when we think about, uh, when we look at perspectival 
disagreements. Um, I, I take it that perspectival disagreements are situations in which we have a common um, body of information and yet a very different sort of persistent disagreement in interpretation. Um, uh, and they typically have this sort of character of being both, there's a sense in which they're very deep, a feeling that they're slippery, they're hard to pour, pin down exactly what the disagreement is. And it's uh, for that reason, difficult to resolve them. And just to, you know, I think just to display some ones that I think are um, illustrative. So, you know, how uh, should one wear a mask and in what situations? Or should one cover one's head in what situations? Um, uh, how should one think about and what are the likely consequences of and antecedents of a police shooting a homeless man on the street? Um, why did the dishwasher get unloaded or not get unloaded uh, today? You know, um, should this person be given tenure or this this candidate be given a you know um, awarded tenure or not? Um, are minds computers or are they not? How should we think about minds? What is justice? Right. So these are uh, there's a wide range of topics here. They range from the like you know from the political to the highly um, theoretical, from the sort of individual to the collective. Um, uh, so, you know, I've tried to give you a wide illustration, but in all these cases, I think you can imagine, I hope you could imagine a, what feels like a perspectival disagreement about the, the particular situation. I also want to say that it, often we see these um, perspectives and perspectival disagreements at work in the display, the, the deployment of distinct framing devices. So the way I think of framing devices is those are, these are mantras or memes, metaphors or another case, they need not be linguistic, they might be symbols. These are um, representational vehicles that have the function of expressing and sort of suggesting and guiding interpretation in this ongoing uh, open um, perspectival way. And I've given some illustrations I take um, to be there. So what I've just done is just gestured at, pointed at a phenomenon that I take that I hope and assume that will be um, uh, familiar from your ordinary lives um, and perhaps depending on where you travel from your theoretical discussion. I mean, I think this is the kind of thing people talk about when they, in standpoint epistemology or in thinking about um, distinct paradigms or perspectives in science. I mean, there's a wide range of appeals to this kind of thing. Um, and across these different domains, both in ordinary discourse and in theoretical analysis, this perceptual talk is very, very natural. People want to talk about point of view and orientation and worldview and standpoint and perspective. Um, but very often the domains that are, that are being, that these are being talked about are abstract non-perceptual domains. And at the very least, very robust, you know, complex cognitive um, uh, resources are being brought to bear here. So the question is then, what do we make of this perceptual metaphor? Um, so I want to bring in three different models for thinking about the um, metaphor, the analogy with perception for understanding perspective in this relevant high level interpretive kind of way. The first is thinking about um, indexical representation. So is thinking about perspective as point of view, as literal point of view and extrapolation from literal point of view. So I take it that literal point of view involves indexical representation of a scene, of a situation which is represented, anchored at a, 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 a location L at which the agent is typically is situated, um, relative to some kind of structure S, right? Some kind of, um, uh, um, in, you know, in, in the perceptual case of physical space, right? Um, and this, but I think that this is also the kind of um, view that we get, um, the, a kind of incipient appeal to this kind of literal point of view is what we also think of uh, are, are, uh, is underlying Frege's idea of senses, um, the idea of like, you know, uh, a sense as a, um, you know, a, a, the I, um, what is, we see in a telescope, what, what, what is given by a telescope, it's an angle on, a particular situation. You can have multiple agents at different locations accessing the same content, but they differ in their interpretation in virtue of occupying different locations uh, on which they approach that situation. That's, that's supposed to apply to the abstract kind of case. 
Um, so that gives us some of the things we care about and it looks like we need to sort of appeal to to make sense of differences in interpretive perspective. Um, the idea that some things are closer or further away, um, the idea that you can only, there's limitation, you can only see so much, not everything is accessible from a point of view. Um, the idea that what is presented is presented in relation to oneself and in relation, the objects are presented in relation to one another. Um, so those are all, I think, important resources, important parts of the analogy that we want to sort of make use of. Um, but there, I think this an appeal to a point of view is, is, has really important limitations. One is, as I said, we want to apply to um, the notion of interpretive perspective that we're interested in here to apply to abstract topics and abstract representations of those topics. Um, and so it's not clear how you would do that in, you know, standpoint epistemology or um, other some more socially invested um, analyses, say by Bourdieu or Rancière, you see people uh, talking about trying to cash out a model of social space. Um, but, you know, and there's work to be done there. And I think that's interesting, but it's, you know, that's a lift, that's a task. Um, uh, another thing is, an, uh, but in a way, the opposite problem is that um, it seems as if in many of these cases we want to talk about, it seems as if there can remain, even in the perceptual case, a difference in interpretation, in, you know, one's perspective in the relevant intuitive sense, even given two agents who are anchored at a common index at a common location, looking at a common scene, right? So in using Frege's uh, metaphor of the telescope, you could have two people who are looking at the same object from the same, um, uh, through the same telescope, and yet their perspectives on the scene could be significantly different in the relevant sense. So what does that mean? Um, uh, so uh, one thing that people have often appealed to here, and I think of this as an analogy to Frege's idea of coloring, um, is a kind of experiential, perhaps iconic representation of qualia, right? Of the what it's like to access that scene from that location. And maybe there's uh, additional factors, more personal factors that you bring in, uh, maybe species factors, maybe more personal factors that you bring to bear there. And again, I certainly don't, I'm not committed to denying that that's relevant or that that's something that happens, that that's an aspect of um, perception. But there's a worry, what is this, uh, you know, in essentially private qualia? Um, what is its relationship to the content? What, in what sense can we share it? What difference does it make? Um, so although I don't want to deny that there's something it's like to be a bat or to be a vampire and that I can't know that, um, you know, um, so I think this is the kind of notion that people like Nagel and Paul are appealing when they're, to when they're talking about, you know, differences of perspective on a scene um, or as a, a topic. That seems potentially relevant to me, but I don't want to rest too much weight on it. And I think, again, there's uh, something about intuitive perspectives, interpretive perspectives that is not given by that. And so what I want to rest more heavily on is um, a aspect of perception, which isn't um, touched by either of those, which is the sort of idea of gestalt organization, right? So um, this is an aspect of perception. This is something that manifestly can differ even given a common informational access from a common, you know, index of a common scene. Um, uh, the same, the, the very, not just two different agents, but the very same agent can have a different perspective on the same scene. Um, we experience this um, uh, in cases of uh, ambiguous figures. Um, so what's going on here? So there are three features that I wanna draw out in the um, appeal to Gestalt uh, organization. The first is that uh, Gestalt parses this complex manifold into elements, elements that have a certain significance. So, in, and then secondly, um, and that may be more or less automatic in virtue of like very dramatic contrasts in, you know, in, uh, in coloration, or it may be more, you know, cognitively loaded. The second thing is that a Gestalt organization imposes a figure ground structure, and we see that with the Scottish cross, you can pop either way. And then the final thing is that it gestalts, it organizes, integrates those elements, those parsed significant elements into a complex whole where the significance of those parts may depend, often does depend upon their role within the whole. And so that's what we see here with the 
old lady, young lady figure. I guess I should maybe I'll um uh well yes roll out out there. So um in the old lady, young lady figure, it can be seen in two ways. Um, in the various elements, like that strong horizontal line, it. It, or that little little bump on the far left of the of the figure, they have different degrees of importance. They pop out in one's attention. They draw one's attention, and they mean different things depending on which of the two um, uh, uh, in concepts one applies in perception: old lady or young lady. Um, okay, so that's the kind of that's the the aspect of perspective that I want to sort of make sure comes to the table here. So given that, that's what the sort of aspect, the elements out of perception that I want to extract, then I want to understand an interpretive perspective of this sort of high level cognitive phenomenon um, in the following way, sort of appealing to various of these aspects, these um, analogies to actual perception that I've um, alluded to above. Um, so a perspective, as I understand it, is a disposition to interpret. It's a style of noticing, relating, and responding to parts of the world. So there are three parts of that, the noticing, the relating, and the responding. Attention uh, is does the noticing. So it focuses on information of certain kinds. It does that by parsing lower level features relative to a pre presupposed taxonomy, um, a taxonomy of you know, categories of kinds of things. Um, and that taxonomy itself assumes certain purposes certain priorities, certain things matter, um, uh, and a certain distributions, rough homeostatic clusters of, uh, of lower level features. Things tend to go together, the lower level features tend to go together. Um, so given a parsed, um, uh, a, a parsed uh, field, a, a parsed manifold, a field a, a manifold parsed into kinds, um, attention then selects some of those as worthy of attention at all. And among those which are assigned, uh, which make it to, you know, to counting, to uh, rising to the level of consciousness, it just uh, assigns different levels of prominence to various of those features. So that is something I think we see varying again in the old lady, young lady figure in the um, different ways of seeing it. Um, uh, so that might be, and that's something that, again, is, you know, sort of palpably illustrated by the invisible gorilla. Um, uh, certain features don't show up at all if they're not relevant to the purpose. Um, uh, those that do are, you know, um, have a higher uh, degree of uh, uh, prominence in one's attention. The thing, the, the what can make a feature be more or less prominent maybe is typically partly a matter of, you know, actual physical properties, like the brightness of a light relative to um, the ambient lighting in the room, but it's often um, cognitively mediated. Uh, it may be, it's really surprising to see that color of blue used for the cloak of Mary's, um, for Mary's cloak in a painting of that genre, right? So it might be a very uh, cognitively mediated kind of surprise, uh, drawing attention. Um, uh, okay, um, so that's attention leads us to notice things and uh, be more likely to recall features uh, depending on which perspective we bring to bear. The second thing is that uh, perspective doesn't just uh, lead us to allocate attention in certain kinds of ways. It leads us to connect the, uh, well, the features that we pay attention to into complex networks of centrality. There are a wide range of bases of, on which we can connect various features. Some of these are sort of um, philosophically respectable, rationally respectable, uh, like material and logical implication. They can also be more sort of um, metaphysically substantive or, um, sort of I don't know, realistic, like causation, mere statistical correlation. And they can also be sort of putative, at least putatively normative, like moral and aesthetic justification. They may also be, we may just connect features in our experience because they were contiguous in space and time when we first encountered them. It may just be like Proustian, you know, association that also happens, but we often then try to impute a more normatively justifying basis to such uh, associations when we have them in our intuitive thinking. And then finally, given that we are paying attention to certain aspects of a scene, 
connecting and explaining them in certain kinds of ways that then motivate certain kinds of responses to that scene. Um, uh, sometimes those are practical responses. I, you know, um, if I am, if my perspective leads me to parse the person's gesture before me as threatening, I may be more likely to see the thing in their hand as a weapon and more likely to respond in uh, a defensive or aggressive posture, depending on my um, personality. So it might be a practical response. It might be an emotional and evaluative response, right? I might think that they're wrong or um, I might feel fear. Um, and it might be an aesthetic response. I might think it's disgusting to act that way. Okay, so that um, is, you know, so, okay. that's my whirlwind tour through what I think goes into a perspective. Uh, I want to draw out there two ways, at least I think there are actually more than five, but I want to draw attention to two ways in which I think perspectives understood in this way are non-propositional. They depart from um, uh, propositional attitudes as philosophers at least typically construe them. One is that they're open-ended tools for interpretation rather than thoughts for tools for thinking rather than thoughts per se. So having a perspective on justice or on minds or on our marriage doesn't just explain, uh, uh, produce a response to the dishwasher getting unloaded or not getting un unloaded, or you know um, uh, whether there must be uh, you know um, compositional rent mental representations in order to explain processes of thought or whatever. It doesn't just explain a, partic a particular evaluation or belief about a particular thing. It guides a whole ongoing range of the formation and updating of beliefs in general about that domain. Um, the second thing is that having a perspective is not a matter of having propositional attitudes in the sense that explicitly entertaining or endorsing some set of thoughts is neither necessary, propositional attitudes, is neither necessary nor sufficient for having a perspective in the relevant sense. Having the perspective requires implementation in intuitive, that is non-efferful cognitive processes in a way that's partly but not entirely under voluntary control. And that's, I think, the thing that I, one of the things I really want to get out of the, like the old lady, young lady figure in the gestalt, you can try to see it in a certain way. Trying can help, but trying doesn't guarantee success. Um, success means that your actual dispositions to pay attention, to assign significance, to um, connect and to respond and uh, expectations that you form are actually guided by the relevant um, cognitive processes. All right, so that was an unfairly rapid tour through a sort of thumbnail sketch of my view about perspectives in this very high level interpretive uh, sense. So how can we use that to try to understand the way in which mm, actual physical representations, actual um, vehicles, representational vehicles in the world can express perspectives. So, and, and eventually I want to say something about how artworks can express perspectives. So um, the, here, I think we need to think about the different ways in which we, different kinds of vehicles work. So different sy semiotic systems just employ different principles of formation and interpretation. Here, I think it's useful to sketch, uh, um, it's a, I want to think of it as a multidimensional space, but a kind of continuum. I'm going to treat it as a continuum from fully iconic to fully propositional or fully discursive um, uh, rep representational systems. Of course, this is a whole different talk, which I am again going to give a mere thumbnail sketch of. Um, at the extremes, fully iconic systems are analog uh, in the sense of re representing highly specific values along dense magnitudes, also analog in the sense of representing many features simultaneously and in relation to each other. And they're also, so they're analog in those two senses, they're also concrete in the sense that they exploit physical resemblances between the vehicle and the content. So they use aspects of the physical vehicle in order to represent, uh, to have representational significance. In the simplest case, you know, they use a patch of scarlet to represent being scarlet, right? Uh, at the other extreme, fully discursive or propositional systems are sparse and abstract. So they represent just a few values, which are digitally, which have are digital, right? There's, they le le lump together many variations as counting is of the same kind. So there are many, many variations in being a bed that all fall under the extension of the term bed. 
Um, so they're digital values. A sentence only gives you a few of those different, uh, uh, a few words represent a few of those values. Um, they are presented piecemeal rather than sort of indirect combination. Um, and using in sentences, binary branching tree structure. Um, and the mapping from vehicle to content uh, exploits arbitrary relationships, for instance, convention. Again, much more to say there. What I've said is controversial in various kinds of ways. Um, I, I'd be happy to talk about that. Um, but given that kind of difference in modes of in the, the compositional and expressive principles for these different semiotic systems um, with pictures at the, you know, toward the end of the iconic and sentences toward the end of the um, propositional, those differences underwrite distinct representational expressive profiles. So pictures represent abstract, um, pictures work in the first place by um, presenting bare bones contents, contents that are instantiated and determinate. Um, and I don't want to insist that they can only represent bare bones contents. I think that there's a lot represented in a picture that goes beyond the bare bones patches of color or whatever. The bare bones are really, really bare on an interview like this. Um, I think we can see in pictures and pictures depict things like bodies in space, boy, a young boy, um, a young terrified boy, um, uh, you know, a sad and anguished father, right? So um, Isaac being, you know, um, um, at the moment of realizing his father intends to kill him, right? So I think we can see that in the painting and then the painting represents that, but that more abstract meaning is anchored in the more um, in the bare bones content by and we recover it by means of perceptual recognition. So there's amplification from uh, bare bones content, which is anchored. And then there are maybe other contents which the picture represents, um, say that the God has given uh, Abraham a reprieve or something, but that is merely implicated. That is not represented in the picture, I would say. So if you get to the extent that you get abstract contents in pictures, it is either amplified from bare bones content or implicated from anchored content. By contrast, language excels at encoding abstract contents and it does so directly, it just denotes them. It does so selectively, whereas the picture has to show you a ton of details in order to show you any particular detail the language can be extremely selective. And whereas the picture has to depict, you know, Abraham holding his arm in a certain way, right? Uh, the picture, the a sentence, a lang language can be highly indeterminate in its mode of representation. It doesn't have to make all those commitments. Um, and so for instance, there are things that you can directly represent in language that you can't directly represent in, uh, or only by amplification in pictures. For instance, causal and normative relations between, uh, right, you can't represent in pictures at all, you can only implicate. For instance, causal and normative relations between spatio-temporally spatio -temporal, disparate events or purely quantificational information. Um, so that, you know, we often sort of celebrate the expressive power of language in those respects, but by contrast, that expressive, that in virtue of those expressive representational principles, language can only represent concrete contents, contents like what color, what expression on the face, whatever, indirectly, by extension to a real, by evoking or presenting a real or called sample, and it encodes most relational, most relations um, separately, right? As a matter of uh, it piecemeal. Um, and uh, okay, so now we can begin to turn to thinking from, we can turn from thinking about how representational vehicles differ in their expressive and representational powers in virtue of the different compositional and uh, expressive principles to thinking about art in particular. So we're, I think there's a kind of very general prediction, which is that pictures tend to awaken the senses as the Council of Trent said, and Caravaggio was actually paid to do this, right? The painting is, was, you know, a, um, a, a work for which he was, which was, you know, the function of which was to awaken the senses to religious devotion. Um, by contrast, stories tend to build extended structures that 
focus on the small movements of the inner world, as Martha Nussbaum says, things like patterns, complex patterns of thought that people and, you know, causal connections among patterns of thought. And another sort of prediction of looking at these differences and how these different systems work is that imagination is more likely to fill out pictorial meaning and to fill, so it's more likely to, it's going to have a kind of bottom up um, uh, uh, amplification, whereas imagination is going to play a more of a filling in uh, role in the case of linguistic meaning. It's going to take high level schematic information and fill in details, supply details. So that's a kind of first pass at differences in the kinds of ways in which imagination is going to be brought to bear um, in the different given different media depicting the same scene. However, I just want to, you know, people have taken this kind of thing and run way too far with it. So I just want to emphasize that all interpretation uses imagination to go what, beyond what's actually given in the um, uh, in the um, vehicle um, and or that what's encoded um, and uh, and that aesthetic engagement in particular generally involves what Colin calls a total imaginative experience, which is multimodal in rich ways. Um, and that's really important. So, um, right. okay. So uh, given this, or these, this, uh, these claims about the different ways in which imagination is likely to be harnessed by different media depicting what is in some important sense, the same scene, what can we say about how that will in turn affect the perspectival resources that those media bring to bear? So in, uh, what I want to say is that, I mean, this shouldn't be very surprising at all, that um, pictures really use literal point of view, right? So they exploit compositional structure to guide uh, interpretation by parsing, focusing, and linking parts of the scene. So if we go back to Caravaggio, um, we see that, you know, there are um uh the scene is not just given to us you know uh, that there that that there is isaac abraham and an angel and a ram um with a lot more detail um we have uh you know that um the angel is closer to us than abraham is we have that um you know abraham occupies a very large portion of the scene right physically um but he's also painted in darker tones whereas the angel and isaac their skin tones are more similar and there's this gesture that you know sort of uh, uh a continuous line which makes it easy for the eye invites the eye to move among those so i mean you know i'm not an art historian i don't know how to do this in detail but that is the kind of thing those are the kinds of resources um proximity size relation hue texture those are the sorts of features that um uh, uh painters use to um, uh, invite a, a perceptual gestalt to, to in, and entrain viewers into a perceptual gestalt. And then that perceptual gestalt expresses a correlative cognitive gestalt, an a, a sort of allocation to the subject matter, which is represented in those, um, uh, by those aspects of the scene um, and suggests ways in which to amplify and extend the encoded contents. And thereby it suggests, uh, it motivates certain kinds of evaluative responses, emotional and perhaps moral and aesthetic. Um, by contrast, I don't think we, we so by contrast, uh, you might think, okay, well, that's how point of view, literal point of view guides interpretive perspectives. Obviously language doesn't do that, right? So how could it do it? You might think it's gonna be really hard for literature to express perspectives. And I think we have that view if we think of language, if at, on a, uh, on a model of um, predicative calculus, on the kind of model of formal logic that we, uh, you know, often use, and that I might be, you know, sort of evoked by it, it, contrasting um, picture iconic and propositional um, modes of representation. But in fact, natural languages are shot through with perspectival mechanisms. It's a deeply part of what the way that natural language conventionally functions that it's guiding uh, perspectives, interpretive perspectives in this sense. So for instance, clause length and structure 
focuses attention, allocates attention um, uh, in sort of um, in highly specific ways. So syntax is relevant here, is implicated here. Um, the lexicon it plays a really important view. We do have elements that uh, have a pretty close analog to indexical point of view in the form of, you know, um, here and there, um, uh, uh, came from afar, went. Um, so, it, it, you know, call, they're called perspectival terms sometimes. Um, also, we see the sort of more high level coloring and gestalt features in operation in uh, the choice of vocabulary. So, for instance, the describing uh, what happened just about happens to Isaac as a sacrifice rather than a slaughter, right? Um, the uh, metaphor of the stars of heaven and sand on the seashore, right? These um, uh, suggest interpretive perspectives uh, in um, certain kinds of ways. And then discourse structure also, so ascending to a higher level discourse structure which can have syntactic implications, but isn't necessarily syntactic, um, also guides per, per, uh, interpretive um, perspectives in important ways. For instance, um, linear order, the use of connectives like then, so, or but, the use of clefting to focus attention behind him was a ram, um, the use of presupposition, your son, your only son. Um, uh, and then finally, uh, outside of the scope of what we would normally think of uh, as, you know, language properly conceived in the philosophy of language or linguistics, there are these features of phonesthetics, right? The mode of representation. There's a way in which language is not, is partially iconic. Natural languages as used and especially as used in art, in literature, are we're, that we draw on, it's not purely abstract, um, uh, speakers and writers draw on um, the physical features of the language um, in the form of rhyme, rhythm, and repetition um, in order to sort of display, to manifest, and express, and entrain perspectively fitting verbal styles. So just going back, for me, one of the most poignant parts of the description in the story here is Abraham's repeated saying of um, here I am, um, both to God and to his son. I find this incredibly poignant that he's like, here I am stuck, caught in this situation and responding to it. Um, uh, okay, so uh, now in conclusion, I think we can sort of like, you know, make a little bit more good on or do a little, have a little more to play with on this, you know, canard that a picture is worth a thousand words. On the one hand, uh, uh, fictional media, I'm sorry, visual media, um, they show an abundance of concrete things as they at least fictionally are. And they rely heavily on experiential immersion and literal point of view to guide attention, including high level interpretive attention, and to generate commensurate effective responses. And they rely heavily on pragmatic inference to extrapolate high level content, sort of abstract, um, causal, explanatory um, uh, interpretive contents, including narrative structure. By contrast, um, so they start with the really concrete and sort of use imagination to extrapolate this high level stuff. Um, by contrast, linguistic media tell their readers a highly curated selection of claims about a wide range of contents. Really, you know, they don't, aren't, don't have to be the kind of things that you can see. Um, and then they rely heavily on iconic imagination to supply concrete instantiations of that high level abstract content and on interpretive amplification to supply implicit relations among those abstract features, like that this caused that or explains that or whatever. Um, so I, you know, what I've done is sort of sketch some big differences in the way, you know, um, in the way that uh, some big first order differences in the ways that imagination will be used in um, encountering artworks, uh, uh, even in different media, uh, even when they're about the same scene. People have loved to explore this topic for centuries, right? And um, what I want to emphasize is that I don't think, as I as I said, I, it's not like that there's one kind of imagination used in one case and another kind of imagination is used in another case. There's this total imaginative activity. And also it's not that there's a, you know, 
it's not that some media are better or worse for depicting certain topics or that certain uh, media are better or worse aesthetically in general in virtue of the way in which they harness the imagination. Rather, it's that they um, present the different media in virtue of the ways in which they represent and express contents. Um, display different profiles of aesthetic and um, artistic opportunity and constraint for um, their recipients, for artists, and then in turn for audiences. Um, and that artists then navigate those profiles of opportunity and constraint in their own distinctive ways. And that's part of the excitement uh, of looking at, of, of engaging with art in general. And that's it. Thank you. <laughs>